So what should be considered and what happens in normal cases, right? And when I say normal cases, I mean cases that are not as high profile as this one. Let's bring in uh, part of our think tank tonight, our Georgia contingent. Joining us in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney, former federal prosecutor, Michael Sterling is with us. Also with us in Atlanta, criminal defense attorney, president of the Georgia Criminal Defense Attorneys, uh, Lawrence Zimmerman Association. All right. Um, uh, Lawrence, I'm going to start with you, okay? You're the president of the Criminal Defense Association in Georgia. In a felony murder case, do defendants in the state of Georgia get bond? Absolutely, Biddy. In the state of Georgia, the Supreme Court said in a seminal case, Ayala versus State, that the presumption of innocence still applies in capital offenses. And if you look at this case, and I know that the lawyers intimately well have worked on lots of cases with them, um, great lawyers. The issues are that this, the defense has the burden of production to produce evidence and witnesses that they have ties to the community and have good character. The preponderance of the evidence is on the state to prove that they're a significant danger to the community, that they're significant danger to commit a felony while on bond, there's significant risk of flight, that there's significant danger to or significant to um, danger to intimidate witnesses. So the McMichaels and I don't think yet, Brian, nobody has a record. There's no there's no testimony that they've threatened anybody. There's no testimony that they've tried to flee prior to being arrested had several months before anybody even found out. Or I mean, they had an opportunity. They have ties to the community. They have nowhere to go. The court looks at all these things, and if they don't have a prior um, serious violent felony, the court could set conditions of bond to ensure that they'll return, to ensure that they're not a danger. Listen, Every person who's accused of crime has some kind of risk, right? I mean, it's just a human element. But the question is, is there significant risk? And in this case, because it's high, pro high profile, I'm afraid the judge may not make the decision within the four factors laid out by the Georgia legislature and the Supreme Court. Because from what I've heard so far, and people may disagree, but this is for bond. The Supreme Court has said that it's not for punishment. We don't hold people pretrial for punishment. That's what a trial's for. You're presumed innocent in the state of Georgia, and these men are still presumed innocent, no matter what the case, no matter what the charge. Michael, do you see any risk? Do you see any danger? Do you see risk of flight, a danger to the community, um, fear in the community that something may happen here if, in fact, they are given bond? Yeah, I see a risk, Benny. Uh, uh, I see a risk because they trapped and hunted down someone who was doing absolutely nothing wrong. They hunted him down and shot him in the middle of the day in broad daylight. So I don't know how you look at these individuals as anything other than hunting murderers. Uh, not to mention the fact that they had significant relationships with the DA who was just unelected based on the fact that she completely botched this case. She just got unelected from office. They had significant connections with that DA who was ultimately recused from this case. So when you consider their law enforcement connections, when you consider the fact that they, uh, the DA and the investigators in that case completely botched this case and failed to prosecute these individuals appropriately, when you consider the fact that they have all of these significant connections that they hunted, someone and murdered them in broad daylight who had committed no crime, who had done nothing wrong. I certainly think that the judge is well within their rights to consider these two individuals a danger to the community and to deny them bond. Now, as someone who fights for bond every single day on behalf of defendants, that's hard for me to say. But in many of the cases that I handle, you don't have someone who, for no apparent reason whatsoever, hunt someone down who is simply jogging in a neighborhood and murders them, and then there's significant evidence that they did it simply because of the color of their skin. Uh, I, I, I don't handle those type of criminal, the, the, those types of criminal cases are rare for me. Uh, but I, I do think that there is at least some evidence here that the, why the judge would deny them bond. Uh, you trapped somebody, you hunted them down in broad daylight, you killed them, and then you use your significant connections to try and avoid prosecution for many months. I want you to take a listen uh, 
to some of the testimonies here. This was from the son. So Travis McMichael is the one who, who gets out of the truck and actually uh, is holding the weapon and, and fires it uh, and kills Ahmad Arbery. This is one of his friends testifying, and there's going to be a lot of beeps that you're going to hear. Just presume all these beeps um, have a lot of racial overtones to them and are words we can't say on television, okay? Let's take a listen. I'll direct your attention, since you said you did not recall, to Facebook uh, in a post on October the 17th of 2019. Uh, do you recall Travis commenting on a photo that you posted, and he said, quote, ha, 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 exclamation point, sayonara, your Do you remember that? I'm not sure. Do you by chance know what that post was that you put up to which Travis McMichael replied with No, sir, I don't know. Let me ask you about um, some text messages between you and Travis McMichael, specifically November the 28th of 2019. Do you remember uh, Travis McMichael texting you about shooting a crackhead with gold teeth and a high point 45. You remember that text exchange? No, sir, I don't not. You actually responded to it saying something about Newports and a 40. You remember that? No, I'm, no sir, I do not remember that. Do you recall that text exchange between you and defendant Travis McMichael in which he was talking about shooting a black with gold teeth that had a high point 45? He was referring to a raccoon. Okay. No. A, a raccoon with gold teeth and a high point 45? It was being facetious. Mm -hmm. To which you responded that this raccoon needed Newport cigarettes. Is that, is that your testimony? Yes, sir. That is an exchange between you and defendant Travis McMichael, correct? Yes, sir. All right, that witness was uh, put forth by the defense, and we've got Ann Bremner joining us tonight uh, from Seattle, Washington. Uh, we got everything hooked up. Um, but let, let me start yes. with, with Lawrence first on this issue. Lawrence, do racist posts and racist text messages, is that part of the equation when it comes to a bond hearing? Well... I'm not clear. Was that text message Vinny sent after the shooting before. or before? Before. Then I don't think, I don't think, listen, I mean, no one's condoning that he's racist at all, but if he's racist, it doesn't necessarily mean he's a killer. So I don't think that has to do with the bond hearing. I respectfully disagree with my friend over there, Mr. Sterling. I get that these men are charged with a heinous crime, but that's the, that's for the jury. That's not for issue of bond. They're, they're just, they're, we got factors to ana uh, analyze. And what happened that Michael's talking about, that's for the trial. That's not for a bond hearing. That'll be litigated later. All this to me is extraneous, and it's all there to prejudice the defense and to put it out there so they're denied bail. We just stick to the factors. I mean, talk about their character. What, what's the evidence they're going to flee? I mean, what, what have they done in their life that they've committed other felonies? If they don't have, historically have any felonies that they've committed, what's to say they can commit other, commit other felonies? They've raised a self-defense claim here. Whether it's legit or not, that's for a jury. And I, I want you to uh, chime in here. Do you see these two, this father and son, as a risk to the community if they get out, a risk of flight if they get out? They're not going to show up. Uh, they're going to wreak havoc in the community or potentially perhaps uh, attempt to influence some potential witnesses out there. I think it's all kinds of danger in this case, Finney. And, you know, we always look at evidence of flight. You know, is that is that a potential, but also is some, this person in dangerous? Um, if they're let go. And the fact of the matter is the last violence that they did was penis. And so the best predictor of future violence is past violence. That's all we can measure when we look at future violence. And then potential for flight. This isn't a case that has made national news. Um, and now they're being pilloried, and rightfully so in the press, for some of the things that they've said that were really reprehensible statements. And finally, if indeed we're looking at character in this hearing and they put their own character at issue, we all know, Vinny, that's a huge danger. 
that you better have a pristine background and character if you're going to put your character in issue, which appears that they did. And the prosecution was entitled to bring in uh, this type of evidence that we've just heard. Uh, Michael, let me ask you, do you see the father and son in, in any different light? I mean, one is the one out of the truck with the rifle shooting him. The, the father is on the back of the pickup talking to police at first. And when the gunfire starts, he puts down the cell phone, gets out his gun. Um, do you see them differently at all? It's it, no, Penny. I I don't. Uh, I see them both as murderers. <laughs> I see them both as two individuals who hunted, trapped down a young black man who was doing nothing but jogging in a neighborhood and murdering him. And one person was using their fist, and the other person was using guns. Right? I mean, we're not even talking about bringing a knife to a gunfight. We're talking about bringing guns to a fist fight. <laughs> And no, I, I do not see them any differently. I, I think that they are two individuals who, for no apparent reason, hunted down and murdered a black man who was simply jogging in his neighborhood. All right, folks, our coverage of this case will continue tomorrow. The hearing continues tomorrow. We should have the judges ruling 9 a.m. here on your front row seat to justice. When we return, though, the next big trial here on Court TV out of Ohio. Jury selection tomorrow, opening statements on Monday, the pizza delivery murder trial. We'll talk about that when we come back. The facts surrounding that evening are that there was a phone call placed to the employer of the decedent, right? She worked at Domino's, is that correct? That is correct, Judge. Okay. And a call was made, essentially ordering a pizza. Yes. And then the decedent, um, in accordance with her employment setting, delivered that pizza. That's what this next trial is all about. Next big case here on Court TV. Again, jury selection tomorrow, opening statements on Monday. A phone call to deliver a pizza. But it was really, according to prosecutors, a phone call to lure the victim out. Chanley Painter has more for us tonight. Ashley Biggs never made it home after her last scheduled pizza delivery the morning of June 21st, 2012. The next day, police found her battered body inside her car in a cornfield. She was a sweet girl, loving mother. At the time, the Army veteran was locked in a bitter custody dispute with Chad Cobb over their six-year-old daughter. Cobb pleaded guilty in 2013 to charges including aggravated murder, kidnapping, assault, and robbery for Biggs' death. But questions lingered about the alleged involvement of Erica Stefanko, Cobb's ex-wife. Questions that soon may be answered when Stefanko stands trial for Biggs' murder with Cobb as the state star witness. We are proceeding on a complicity um, theory on the case, so him indicating what he did would be important. It was close to midnight, the end of big shift, when, according to prosecutors, Stefanko called in the pizza order using an unregistered cell phone. He will be testifying that she placed the call, that she was with him when he bought and they together went to Walmart, bought the minutes for that phone. Biggs responded to an empty building in Akron, Ohio, where prosecutors say Cobb was waiting for her. He transported uh, Ashley Biggs, the victim in this case, in her own car. He took her to a very remote location and Ms. Um, uh, Stefanko then picked him up. When police showed up the next day, puddles of blood and drag marks litter the scene, along with taser weapon parts, cash, and coins. Police also discovered an earring, resembling one that belonged to Biggs, but no sign of Biggs or her car. The truth is going to come out about, you know, the whole situation. Cobb was an early suspect because of his fraught relationship with the victim. His daughter, now a teenager, might also be called to the witness stand. She will be testifying in regards to her, what recollection she has of that memory, which is not a whole lot, but she does remember being in the vehicle 
with uh, Ms. Stefanko, uh, and she also recalls hearing the um, phone call to the pizza uh, delivery. The victim's family said they always suspect that Stefanko was involved. Now they're looking forward to her reckoning in court. We thought she got away with it. That's why she acted the way she did. But I'm sure glad they kept going for it. Who buys a burner phone to order a pizza? No, you buy a burner phone when you're up to no good. Let's bring back in the think tank. Um, Ann Bremner, have you ever come across someone who says, listen, I need a, 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 a extra cheese with some pepperoni, but quick. I need to get a burner phone. I don't want anyone to trace this pizza to me. I know. <laughs> Never. I did Google pizza murder cases, and there were quite a few when I was looking at this case. But no, Vinny, absolutely not. I mean, you don't need the burner phone, and that was the first clue, I guess. That is, to me, that, I mean, to me, the case almost stops right there. But Michael Sterling, two key witnesses here for prosecutors. The first one is the convicted murderer, now ex-husband, who was her husband at the time of the murder and is now, I guess when he got locked up, she didn't want to be with him anymore. Now he's her ex-husband and he's going to be testifying against her. How's that going to go? That's not going to go well, Vinny. I mean, obviously he probably has some sort of incentive. It's going to depend on what his deal is with the prosecution. And then a lot of it, is, Vinny, is going to come down to, uh, you know, the burner phone is certainly suspicious, but it could come down to her knowledge of what he planned to do. So the prosecution has a high burden here. Uh, if I'm her defense attorney, I'm arguing. Wait, wait, wait. Did, wait, did you just say a burner phone to order a pizza is just kind of suspicious? No, I mean, yeah, it's suspicious. But Vinny, keep in mind this. What if he had told her, I'm just going to do something to, you know, maybe hurt her or scare her a little bit, and she used a burner phone? So what I'm saying is, what she knew, like she, if she didn't know that his intentions were obviously to, you know, murder the victim, that could come into play. That could be a part of this. If if she, if, if, if I'm her defense attorney and you admit some sort of knowledge that he planned to do something but not murder, then you, you may have a, a potential defense here. You know what else, uh, Lawrence, in this case, another witness will be the daughter I mean, she was the one in the middle of this custody battle. Back then, she was seven years old. Now she's 15. She says she's scared of Stefanko, but she's also apparently going to testify about that phone call. I mean, you know, I, I guess it depends on how soon after that phone call is made, what she told the police back then when she was seven, um, compared to what she's saying now. Memories fade and time has gone on, so witnesses' memories are obviously not the same as they were, and she's pretty young. But how, how, you gonna cross how are you going to cross-examine her? She's 15 years old. Her mother was brutally murdered. Her father is testifying against I mean, this is going to be ugly, but um, the defense is going to have to deal with this. Well, like any case, if you have to cross-examine uh, a young person, you do it gently. You know, I mean, you're not, you're not going after them. And, you know, cross-examination, you're not really should be going after people anyway really hard. It's not the movies. You're asking questions, getting your points across, get up and get down real quickly, especially with a young a young witness. And yeah, Bremner, what you what you want to do in a what you want to do when you cross examine a witness like that is you want to get down into very specific facts. So you don't want to try to hurt them, but you want to ask very specific facts. What color was the inside of the car? What color was the you know, person wearing, because what you can do is you can bring into uh, into issue their memory and then you can tell you, then you can argue in closing uh, in your closing statement that, you know, despite the fact that, you know, this victim, this person who says they witnessed this testified, they have a lot of memory issues. They they're, they're because I mean, here, here we are, you know several years later, it's going to be hard for that individual to remember exactly what happened. And, and by questioning the memory, you can potentially argue that to the jury. Yeah, and it's been eight years for this poor 15-year-old girl. Um, mm -hmm. how, how, do you think, how do you think the jury's going to receive her? Oh, I think very well. I think Cross should be, be brief, be brilliant, be seated. I mean, they're going to feel really badly for her. Her life 
in many ways, it's ruined. I mean, but what happened? Her mom was murdered. You know, now she's a witness. She's a central witness, the most important witness in this case, and she's willing to testify. They're going to be all ears, and they're going to be all hearts when they hear her and see her. Yeah, I, I, I can't, you know, it's difficult enough, you're, you're a child of divorce and a, and a custody battle, right. and there she is with her mom, but then your mom gets murdered, then your dad gets convicted of the murder, admits to the whole thing, and now you've got to be, um, you know, in the middle of this trial. You know, something else that's happening in this case, Lawrence, that we're, we're learning, is that because of COVID and everything else, I think it, most, if not all the witnesses, may be testifying remotely. You're going to have a jury um, looking at a TV screen like all the viewers are right now. What are your thoughts about a trial being done that way and, and how it may change the dynamics a little bit? Yeah, there's no way um, I'd agree to that. Absolutely not. There, I don't, I've been having hearings the last eight months virtually like this, and it's okay. Sometimes, for the most part, it's been working, but a jury trial? That, that's not that's not how it should work. They should be in person so the jurors could see the people, see their their mannerisms, their, 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 just the way they express themselves, like I'm expressing myself now. There's delay. Sometimes we get delay on court TV. Um, you miss something. There's, sometimes there's feedback. And that's just not a very good way. I don't know the rules in that court that I'd absolutely be against, it, especially in a murder case for crying out loud. Come on. This isn't just a simple battery. This is a murder case. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, look, Lord, look, Vinny, Lawrence is my president. He, he's the he's my president of the Georgia uh, Criminal Defense Lawyers Association, and he's been fighting for us to to make sure we don't end up having to try cases uh, virtually. Uh, and so he's absolutely right. <laughs> that is not something you want to do. Well, uh, here, here's my advice, though. If you are going to testify or make an argument uh, virtually, I think your credibility is bolstered if you have a nice warm fireplace behind you, <laughs> people 100%. will trust you much, Absolutely. much more. All right, Absolutely. tomorrow, Court Thanks. TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter will be on the ground in Ohio for jury selection in this trial. And she'll also be in the newest episode of the Court TV podcast, which is out today. This week, we'll be breaking down the newly released Lori Vallow Daybell audio recordings. Here's a preview. We have something uh, in this episode that is pretty amazing. Uh, newly uncovered recordings of the so-called doomsday cult mom, Lori Vallow Daybell. So let me bring in Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter. To me, Chanley, this is a major, major revelation into figuring out who this woman is. And wow. Yes, Vinny. Just when we thought this story couldn't be any crazier, there's another twist, right? We have Lori Vallow Daybell on a recording talking about wanting to murder her third husband, Joseph Ryan. Unbelievable. You, you can find the Court TV podcast wherever you listen to, and uh, it's always available on CourtTV.com. We'll be right back. On the docket tonight, the disappearance and murder of 11-year-old Gannon Stout. Here's the story of his so-called evil stepmother, Letitia Stout. It begins with a 911 call at 6.55 p.m. on Monday, January 27th. Letitia told the operator Gannon was supposed to come home from a friend's house an hour ago, and she was unable to locate him. At the time, Gannon's father was out of town on reserve duty. A missing person investigation was opened up and a community began to search for a little boy. This was a kid that it was very frequent out front, being very, uh, you know, being a kid, you know, um, very playful, very funny. Whatever we could do just to like show them that we're thinking of them and you know, they're in our thoughts and prayers. As the investigation continued, police began to question Letitia's story. They examined phone records, GPS records, home security system records, and a surveillance video from a neighbor's home. 
Neighbor Roderick Drayton gave investigators his home surveillance video, showing Gannon leaving with his stepmother, then returning without him on the day the child disappeared. He says he searched the video after seeing the stepmother interviewed. It just didn't seem right the right way she was talking. Okay. If my child is missing, I'm going to face the camera and talk to you and let you see the pain in my face. In court, prosecutors spoke about the vast amount of evidence gathered during the investigation. The last number that I heard was over 107 search warrants in this case. Yes, 107. 107. Okay. Um, I think that that number is bigger than that number, though, just based on uh, that was last week sometime that I heard that. These 107 search warrants uncovered a lot including blood stains on Gannon's mattress, blood spatter on this electrical socket next to his bed, evidence of blood in the garage and near the bumper of Letitia's Volkswagen. Many of these blood samples were directly linked to Gannon's DNA. All this, enough to arrest Letitia, who was no longer in Colorado where Gannon went missing. Letitia was arrested on March 2nd in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Then, on March 20th, a huge development. Okay, now to breaking news at five. It is believed that 11-year-old Gannon Stout's remains have been found. Gannon's remains were found not in Colorado, not in South Carolina, but in Florida, 15 miles north of Pensacola, near the Escambia River Bridge in a town called Pace. Today I filed new formal charges in the case against Letitia Stout. Those charges are murder in the first degree after deliberation, a class one felony that carries a potential prison sentence of life in prison without parole. In addition to that, I've filed eight counts of crime of violence for the alleged use of a firearm, a blunt instrument, a knife or other sharp object, and for causing the death of Gannon Stout. Letitia Stauk is presumed innocent, and according to the arrest affidavit, she has a story. She told investigators Gannon was abducted by a Hispanic man named Egardo, who took Gannon at gunpoint after sexually assaulting Letitia inside the family's home. That's a story investigators don't believe, but the question is, will Letitia tell that story to a jury, and will a jury believe it, or will they deliver the justice Gannon's family is looking for? The defense in this case is going to be like a multiple uh, choice exam. You know, what are we going to go with here? We're going to go with the, uh, he went to the friend's house? Or are we going to go with uh, Edgardo, the Hispanic guy, the Hispanic rapist who uh, also abducts child, uh, children and takes them down to Florida? All right, let's bring back in the think tank. Um, not, a good, not a good situation here for the defense, uh, Michael. Um, what are you going to do here? Are you going to go with, uh, yeah, he was at a friend's house. I mean, come on. What, what, what do you do with that? <laughs> Billy, these cases are always tough. Uh, yeah, you know, for me, especially uh, having two young boys, uh, it, it's it's going to be hard. These are these are the type of cases that sometimes make you regret going into the criminal defense field uh, <laughs> because because you've got a client, you know, uh, with a lot of bad evidence, and you've got a child who's dead, and these cases, these cases are hard, and you've got her obviously misleading detectives, lying, not being truthful, uh, and then detectives obviously doing the the very difficult work of ultimately, you know, making her a suspect. It it, 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 it it's going to be hard, especially if you go with the multiple choice option as a as a defense team. Yeah. Uh you know, and we, we've got some good news, I think, for the defense. I got some breaking news here on my phone. Okay. I get the alerts. Egardo mm -hmm. was just spotted with Zanny the Nanny. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> hey. But here's my question, Ann, and, and the reason I bring that up is that woman lied through her teeth as well. That woman had several different stories, but right. somehow, some way, those 12 people from Pinellas County, Florida, uh -huh. um, yeah you know, couldn't see through it all. Yeah, and Vinny, you and I were there to see it in Florida. And it was kind of amazing. I mean, it was explained away as those were imaginary friends and she's kind of weird and she's this and she's that and misunderstood. And it worked. I mean, she was acquitted. People were astonished. Some people weren't. But she lied as easy as, it, as she breathed. Remember, she lied about where she worked, about Zanny the nanny, about where the... 
where Haley was. What I mean, everything she could lie about, she lied about, and yet she was acquitted. Lawrence, why do I think when, when people have a child, right, and you're in charge of a child, and the child goes missing, and then the child is dead, and you lie about it, why do I think that you're guilty? Well, I mean, as a parent of two young children as well, I mean, I don't, I can't answer that question. I mean, I worry about my children 24-7, even when we're all home together all the time, and I hear a strange noise or whatever it is. I mean, I, this is a, wor this is a worst nightmare for any parent. I, I mean... And certainly I'm not going to be going to Myrtle Beach Conference and I have my child. Or, you know, it's just, it's unexplainable. Uh, you know, but these are human beings. For thousands of years, humans have obviously done evil things and, and crazy things. Well, you know? and, and yeah, speaking of crazy things, let's see, let's see what the jury does eventually out in Colorado uh, when they hear this case. By the way, folks, we've got an update as we continue to track this. Uh, a status conference has been set for December 18th. So perhaps on the 18th, we'll find out if we're uh, closer to getting that uh, trial date for Letitia Stauk, the so-called evil stepmom. When we come back, folks, um, a police shooting in Indianapolis caused a lot of outrage. It was live streamed on Facebook. Thousands of people were watching as it happened. Well, the special prosecutor and the grand jury have spoken. What they have to say and your reaction to it, next. I requested this investigation be turned over to the Indiana State Police to conduct as complete and thorough an investigation as possible in as sterile an environment as possible. I believe those goals have been accomplished. On August 21st, 2020, I announced that I would be engaging a special grand jury taken from the community to review the evidence and render a judgment. The special grand jury made up of citizens from Marion County was impaneled to hear the testimony and review the evidence presented. Their charge was to determine if enough probable cause existed to believe a crime had been committed. The special grand jury has concluded its review of this case and I thank each one of them for their service. The special grand jury returned a no bill this term means there is insufficient evidence to indict or accuse Officer DeJure Mercer of a crime. That was the special prosecutor presenting the case to a special grand jury in Indianapolis, the case of Drejan uh, Reed, who live streamed all of this. He's in his car live streaming. Police are following him. Police stop following him at some point. Uh, he gets out of the car. Police are behind him. There's a foot chase. He is still streaming this on Facebook. Thousands of people are watching, including his sister. And then at some point uh, during that chase, you see him fall to the ground, let's go with the phone, and then you hear gunshots. Now, the inv official investigation says that um, he was tased, he fell to the ground, and when he fell to the ground and was tased, he fired his weapon at police, police returned fire. He fired twice, they fired ten times, and he is now... Uh, no longer alive, Drejan Reed in Indianapolis. So, posted all of this on social media. Got uh, your response, your reaction. We we'll begin with our 13th juror. Comment of the day from Judy, who writes, The guy was breaking the law and would not comply and resisted arrest. He fired at the cop who returned fire. You don't comply and resist arrest? You know what's going to happen. Uh, Michael Sterling, in this case, they're changing policy, but they didn't have body cams. The, the family is not convinced uh, that Drejan fired a weapon. Uh, do you think they ever will be convinced of that? Do you think the community uh, will be satisfied by this? Probably not, Benny. Uh, but, you know, that's what that's why you have impartial individuals who are, uh, you know, permitted to step in to take emotion out of it. Uh, to take public perception, to take politics out of it, and to look just at the facts. And here you have a prosecutor who came in, widely respected, who looked just at the facts uh, and then presented it to a grand jury. And obviously, uh, then, it, you know, it came back as a no bill, meaning that there was reason for these cops to have used deadly force in this particular case. And sometimes that is the that is just that is just the instance. It is that is what it is. Jeff tonight writes. 
You have to have evidence to charge and prosecute anyone for a crime. If there's no evidence or not enough evidence, there is no crime to prosecute. Lawrence, have you ever represented someone who's been charged uh, without evidence? Uh, well, I mean, I argue absolutely, and I'm sure the prosecutor would say differently. But of course, um, there's a lot of variables depending on where your case is, the prosecutor, or the judges that may approve a warrant. Um, we'll get the case, we'll investigate the heck out of it and present our side and show there really is no evidence or if there is just, maybe it's really weak. This is a grand jury, though. Grand jury is different. Grand jury is armed with the prosecution. If the prosecution says we don't really think there's evidence uh, to charge, they'll usually go along with it. And if they say there's evidence, usually the grand jury will go along with that as well. Um, you know, these are tough cases, and it sounds like I was watching a little bit before we went on air. It sounds like there were some uh, shells found in his car. Yes, and then they, they, they tried, they tied it all together. Again, I, you know, we don't get to see what happens in the grand jury, so we didn't, we weren't privy to all of that, but they were as transparent as they could be. Allison uh, writing tonight, as an Indianapolis resident, I know we have room for improvement. The effort to ensure unbiased and transparent justice is more than I have seen in my 61 years. I believe the community generally appreciated this. Sad for the family of Drejan Reed. And, and Ann Bremner, that's the other part of this. We can never forget whether there are criminal charges or not. Uh, there's a young man dead. No one wanted that mm -hmm. result. And, and it's sad for the family. Well, yeah, exactly, Vinny. Well said and well said by Allison, who wrote in. I mean, it's terrible for the family because we don't, we, you know, you don't have the death penalty for, for what happened in this case. But in fact, he's dead. And this is something that the officers felt they had to do. There was not a chargeable crime for the grand jury, but he's a young man. He had a family. People loved him. He had his whole life ahead of him, and it's a real tragedy. Terry, tonight, the system is a farce. The police are not capable of holding themselves accountable. The recording should, re should be reviewed by an independent audio-video forensic expert. I would suspect tampering with the recorded evidence. Uh, Michael, are you surprised by this level of distrust? Not just, um, you know, actually tampering with evidence, some folks are, are thinking here. I mean, a little distrust is healthy, Vinny. I mean, having an independent individual come in to review the evidence, you know, as criminal defense attorneys, I'm sure Lawrence will attest to this, you, you know, you have to have a certain level of distrust. I, I've got, you know, video camera evidence in certain cases while bringing a video expert to make sure that we review it and it's not tampered with. Uh, so a, a, a little distrust, particularly of law enforcement, it, it's healthy because it holds everybody accountable. Uh, but it seems like in this particular case, it's been very thoroughly reviewed uh, by all of the uh all of the uh, individuals involved. And we'll finish with one more comment from uh, Lisa, who writes, I don't have trust in the legal system nowadays. Seems like corruption isn't just alive and well down south, but also up north. Some people get by with whatever. All I know is trust no one. All right, Lisa, you can trust us here at Court TV. Um, great job, Michael Sterling, Lawrence Zimmerman, and Bremner. Thank you so much. Always great to have you all on the program. Don't forget, folks, tomorrow morning, our coverage from South Georgia continues in the Ahmad Arbery case. Be sure to tune in at 9 with Ted Rollins. That's it for me tonight. I'm Vinny Politan. Have a great night. And as always, don't forget to hug the kids.